All right. A very good evening to you. You're all very welcome along to this very special episode of Off the Ball. We're here at the Square Ball with thanks to Carlsberg 00 to launch Ireland's first women's sports bar. So it's no longer called the Square Ball. It's now called the Gig. And it's open all weekend. It's a celebration of the 50th anniversary of the women's national team having their first game all the way back on the 13th of May in 1973 against Wales. If you can make it down over the weekend, then do be sure to come down and visit. There's loads of memorabilia on the walls, including Amber Barrett's jersey from the night that she scored the winner against Scotland, and plenty more to get stuck into as well. And it's all part of Carlsberg's campaign to encourage pubs to show the games, and particularly in women's sport. Those fixtures that we will be talking about, of course, Ireland are uh, playing Australia on July the 20th, that's the Thursday. Then six days later, we've got Canada. And then our final group game, not our final game of the World Cup, hopefully, is against Nigeria on Monday the 31st. So uh, no better bandwagon, no better group of bandwagoners than Ireland football fans to get on the bandwagon and support the women's team. Really interesting research that's come out that we're going to be talking about a bit tonight. Only 49% of people have watched women's sport on TV in the pub, whereas 76% have watched the men's team. 40% of adults say that they will watch the women's team in the World Cup, which I think is a little bit on the small side. We'll come back to that in a few minutes' time. As I said, we do love an old bandwagon. To help us talk about this tonight, I'm delighted to say we have Anya Gorman with, I think, 117 caps. Is that correct? Yeah? Today. Nikki, yeah, yeah, yeah. Come on. Yeah. We've got Nikki Evans with, I think, 163 caps? 203. Two. 200 and 200. And Linda Gorman, who played for Ireland from 1973 to 1985. They played fewer games back in those days, but who also managed Ireland from 91 to 92. Correct. You, you, you were telling me you don't technically have any caps just yet. This is a project that you're working on. Well, technically, it's not the word. I do not have any caps for the games I played. However, the FAI... Um, to launch the 50th anniversary of the first match are giving us a commemorative cap and that will be my first cap. Well, we'll talk a bit more about that and, and the occasion itself. Uh, Anya, what's this time like for you where it's all very, very, very exciting but also just a little bit nerve-wracking? Yeah, it's uh, obviously an exciting time in preparation and to the build-up of the World Cup and I think it's every day it's in the back of your mind and in your training and in your matches and in your games and um, everyone's really, really excited um, to get out to Australia but first I suppose we're all working hard to ensure we um, get our place on the plane. My colleague Phil Egan is sitting there and he's like, oh, I remember interviewing Anya when she retired. Best decision you ever made was unretiring. Yeah, that's it, definitely. Yeah, great timing, I'd say. Um, yeah, I obviously took a step back. Um, obviously, it had been given a lot of time to, to playing for Ireland since I was 16 um, and thought it was a good time to take a step back and have a break and I think it was probably the best thing I did because it gave me that fire in the belly again and then Eileen Gleeson went in under Vera Pau and um, there was a time came and they asked me um, would I like to go back in to help the team and obviously I grabbed the opportunity with two hands and never looked back. Did you think when you went back that it would end up in a World Cup qualification? Like, were you thinking this is part of my reason for going back or was it just, I just want to, I miss the games, I miss, I miss playing for Ireland? Yeah, so I came in obviously in the middle of the European Championship campaign, um, which obviously didn't end very well in the game away in Ukraine. So obviously you regrouped and rebuilt it then towards the World Cup qualifying campaign. And I think there was this belief amongst the team that's never really been there before. And obviously we've got a huge crop of talent and mix of very experienced um, young players, the likes of Katie McCabe, Denise O'Sullivan, who are probably in their peaks of their career at the moment. So um, we always believed we could do it, and um, it's an absolute dream come true for it to happen. Where did the belief come from? When did you start thinking this might happen? Yeah, actually, it's kind of surreal because for me, it was off the back of the equal pay deal, and we played Australia in that game in Tallis Stadium, and we got the result, and then we, that kick started our um, World Cup qualifying campaign, from, and from there, I just don't think we look back. Yeah, it's funny, isn't it, how uh, protest really helped? You were saying that you had your own protest back in the day. Yeah, back in the day, a silent protest never went anywhere. That's why the importance of media coverage and the visibility is so, so important these days. Um, yeah, we didn't have um, anybody to take on the mantle of us not having the conditions that the girls, what's it, 30 years later, 26 years later, you know, at their own probably, possibly detriment that they stood in front of the cameras and told the rest of Ireland, 
This is the way we play. This is the way we're supposed to play. We're not looking for any more. We just want the same as what the guys have. Um, and that to me, because I'd been out of the game for about 16 years, switched me back on to watching the women because now we were looking at courageous people off the pitch. Imagine them on the pitch. And look what we are. We're going to a World Cup. Yeah, they backed that up, didn't they? You sure did. Yeah, I mean, I think that's the most impressive thing about, like, if people make a stand and it doesn't go anywhere, it's like, well, you know, they were doing the right thing, but they did actually back it up every step of the way. And, and, and... Did anybody ever hear of FIFA changing a stadium to accommodate supporters? No, but they did for the women. So that's amazing as well. And further, the the cohort of players that we have, we've never seen the likes before. And the FAI have done a 360 in getting behind the girls because they deserve it. But then the girls paid back five years and we're in a World Cup. It's unheard of. It's unheard of in the men and it's unheard of in the women. Except the Irish girls. Nikki, can I bring you in here? Um, I'm really interested in, in your perspective on the journey that the, the women's uh, team have been on over the last period of time, getting to a World Cup and also capturing the imagination of the public because you guys went from very unknown to all of a sudden being front page and back page news in a very short period of time. So what was that, all, that whole experience like of you know, 20 years of trying to become an overnight success? Yeah, I think sometimes I have to pinch myself when I look back at it and um, we were chatting earlier and not a lot of people would have known at the time that we were heading to a World Cup in London back in 2018, except probably close family and I guess we were quietly confident ourselves going into it, but we were second lowest ranked team and we headed off and it was when we started to win games, the, a small bandwagon in Ireland started to grow and... I suppose when you have success and you bring success um, with it comes support and the Irish are no better nation for it and I only hope now that the campaign, that the girls get the support and that they deserve and I've no doubt about it that they're going to go out there and smash it in a couple of months' time. If you look back now at, at how hockey responded to the opportunity that it had, what's your, what's your view on how well or otherwise? Or is there any, anything they could have done better? Or did they actually do a really good job of making sure that anybody who wanted to play hockey in the aftermath of that is getting the opportunity? Yeah, I think there's definitely been a, a huge development at the grassroots level um, in the game, uh, particularly in areas of Ireland that probably hockey had never been seen or played before um, there's been a number of clubs formed since 2018 in smaller areas and it's great to see and even some of the current clubs at the moment they're oversubscribed so a combination of that and kids coming up to you being like oh, I've taken up hockey since 2018 World Cup is yeah it's really inspiring and it's great to see um, a next generation of, of people playing sport. Come here, the, that whole bit though, the build up to the World Cup, you were talking about, um, I think the, the bit where the squad is named and that, that part of actually getting into the group. Are there lessons, that, I know um, your coach came away with like a, a lot of kudos for how he built that team spirit despite the fact you were underdogs. Are there easily applicable things that you think that the football team could maybe do to help them speed up that process when they get there? Yeah, I think um, we were probably on a similar trajectory in that we had been knocking on the door of World Hockey for a number of years um, and just narrowly missing out on qualification for a major tournament. And to like 21 years since an Irish team has played in a World Cup in football and the girls are going this year and it's absolutely, it's brilliant. And um, similar to us, like we would have been quietly confident at an eye on a quarter final going into the World Cup, but... I think it was probably the game by game mentality that we approached each game with. Um, ironically, we treated every game like a World Cup final. <laughs> um, and we never looked beyond the next game. And I don't think you can do that in a competition, but you give it your all, you stick to the process, and um, very much one game at a time. Anya, just the, the whole kind of sense of the, the team building up to get to a point where qualifying actually seemed normal and, and ready, um, it wasn't a straight journey. And you've been involved in, in football at international level for such a long period of time. Why do you think this group is different from the previous groups? What was it that made them ready to actually 
see the opportunity and take the opportunity. Yeah, I think it's obviously the belief that's in the team and the confidence and obviously Fair Pow was a, a big role to play in that and she, she came on and, and took over. And We just have to look at the players coming through. Some have played in underage tournaments, a lot of players playing abroad, full-time football in England. Um, and I think that all just came together and, and came to fruition. And um, I think we've obviously got great Irish heart and spirit as well as um, some very special players and we're always tactically prepared and like Nicky said I think we know the process we know our jobs we know our task when we go on the pitch and um, it's very much always one game at a time It would have been easy for the team though to break up or not be as committed after the heartbreak of the Ukraine experience why did that not happen? Why were you all able to bounce back from that do you think? Yeah I think sometimes moments like that make you stronger um, Certainly did for me, I think, and it makes your bond stronger and you all stick together and everyone ran, rallies around you and the disappointment. And um, I suppose it's all about not getting too low with the lows and too high with the highs. Um, and obviously it makes nights in, in Hamden Park like that extra special. Tell us about the goal. I have not yet got tired of hearing about... What was your view for the goal? Yeah, actually, Denise O'Sullivan got the ball in midfield and I was making a run down the right-hand side and I was shouting for it, of course. Um, raging that she didn't pass yeah, me, raging. It? I was like, Denise, what are you doing? Then Amber Barrett, yeah, amazing touch. Um, toe poked it in. Um, and obviously it was a really special night as well for the people at Chrysler um, that Amber Barrett scored. And even today when I seen it, it was, I think we had a meeting um, before one of the games in America and the goal comes up and you still just get like shivers and the hair stand up um, on the back of your neck. And um, it was just such a special moment and something will obviously... Like it, it it's, a, it's an iconic moment in Irish football and it's the start of something very special. Are, are you aware of just how big this whole thing is or are you trying not to be aware of how big the whole thing is at the moment? Yeah, you know, I think when you're playing and you're an athlete, you're always looking ahead. What's next? What's your next challenge? What's your next goal? Um, and I think it's only when you stop and retire again <laughs> <laughs> that you might look back and, and see how special it is. But at the moment, you're always looking forward, like trying to improve, get better. Um, and obviously be as best prepared you can. Linda, you, you've seen the growth of football and, and you've talked about the, the team uh, being able to seize their moment and, and, and back up what they did. What's your, what do you love about this team? What, what is it that kind of draws you to them? Um, for me, it's the attitude, it's the management, it's, and, and in terms of Vera being management, she's no history in Ireland. There's no politics involved. She's pure football. They have a great staff behind them. It's so different than my day. And she's a selection from an amazing array of players, both home and in England. Um, so it's going to make her job very difficult. I'm particularly looking forward to the two, the two friendly games because at this stage now, I'm sure she has a mindset on what our teams are going to be barring any injuries, you know, so it's completely different than my time, completely different. And I'm sure completely different since before 2017 as well, in many respects. You, you, you talked about it being different from your time. I think a lot of people listening tonight and people in the room won't be familiar with that kind of the period where the team started to come into its existence and even your own background. Um, and how your coaching journey started. So maybe we'll just talk a bit about that for a few minutes. Um, can you talk to me about Liam Toohey's influence in your coaching career? Um, well, I had, it was just a natural progression for me because I had, had the opportunity to have an amazing coach called um, Kevin Healy. He was with Bose. He was miles ahead of everybody else in terms of women to the point that he brought the Bose team, or sorry, he brought us up to the Bowes team's training grounds, and we shadowed their players. So I was a left full, and I was shadowing Fran O'Brien in relation to where the ball was. So now my focus wasn't on my game, it was on how I can link with other, other players. Um, the other aspects as well of, we had to self-fund ourselves because we had to pay for our own trips away. Um, we hadn't got the facilities and all the, all the stuff that I'm actually tired talking about, which they don't have today. And it's so different for the girls today. Yet, we have the same passion. We have the same vision. 
we, when they kick a ball, we kick a ball. When they go in for a crunching tackle, we go in for a crunching tackle. Um, it's, it's just exactly the same. So after you finished playing, uh, Liam Toohey asked you to set up the girls section at home farm. Well, I didn't actually finish playing because I was coaching a school girls side and it was Belvedere. I played for Belvedere. They had a women's section and then one of the players set up a, a, a girls, school girls section. So, and she asked me would I coach them, which was great because it was a natural progression for me. It was, I won't say it was awkward because it wasn't awkward. I was the only girl ever to be there among hundreds of guys doing coaching. They were called badges then, their licenses now. Um, so, but I was never phased because Anya will tell you, when you're focused, you're focused. So it was just a natural progression for me to get involved in, in coaching. And because I got involved in coaching and because I was the on, only girl and because they wanted to have a representative across like some type of equality. I got to go to all different um, training events and sessions and that they were running and bringing in English coaches over. So I knew, I knew um, of Liam Toohey, but I really knew him when I became involved in the Football Association of Coaches and Trainers. And he's an amazing guy. So when it didn't work out for me on the national side, he rang me and he said to me, um, Linda, can you come down? I want to have a meeting with you. And um, I had said, yeah, okay. So I went down and he said, um, I want to start a women's section in Home Farm. And I said, hold it, Liam. I'm not selling tickets for the guys. That's not what we're here for. Because that's my pers um, experience. They get the women in, they sell the tickets, they do this, 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 this. And to support the men, so I said, I'm not going to do that. And he said, no, 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 no. So very lucky, got a bunch of girls. And you know, believe it or not, eight of them were academics up in um, DCU. And uh, we won back-to-back -back leagues for the, f for the first two years, which was great. And because the women play in the summer, the guys play in the winter, we were finished our season. So I just said to Liam, listen, any chance of giving one of the guys side a dig out, just a dig out. Now you can imagine, you're, you're among really good coaches up in Home Farm, who some of them went to Belgium to get our, Holland to get our qualifications. So you don't know that they're watching you because you're focused on what you're doing and you know where you want to go. So um, the under 18s Premier side had lost a manager at Christmas time and the club wanted to retain the players at least till the end of the season and they hadn't really been doing very well. And of course, morale was down. So they asked myself and a guy called um, Joe Swain, real savvy, street, inner city guy who knows his football and knows his people. And we took on the side for the other half of the season where we won the All-Ireland and we won the league. It was amazing, amazing. And then I got to um, be part of the crew when that side played against Ajax in Tolka Park to be sitting beside Liam Toohey, a man of very few words, very few words, and just listen to him talking about a couple of players, just a couple of little things. We went in at half time, spoke to one guy, he only spoke to one guy, went back out, about 15 minutes later, the guy wasn't doing what he was asked to do, and he was actually the best, I thought he was the best player on the pitch, but wasn't doing what he was asked to do. So he came off, and I mean, I just, we lost 3-2. I was just on a high, just being part of all that. And then we played Leeds, and that was great, you know. And then the following year, um, he asked me, would I manage the under 15 Premier Schoolboy side? Now, I was aware that this is a side where there was going to be a lot of money if you had good players and English, that's the time when the English were coming looking for the schoolboys. Um, but believe it or not, I was interviewed by the parents. You know, that's what happened with me. Several of the parents wanted to know what my views were because they had already tentatively had spot clubs in England that were looking at them. But anyway, First time in 25 years we won the treble in Home Farm and I, I, I was the only woman that did it. So, thanks very much.
And then the following year, we won the double with the 16s. And the following year, we won the, um, the double with the 17s. At the same time, because I don't get paid to do it, I was freelancing type of stuff. And I was asked would I help out the sheriff school boys, do a bit of coaching. And was one thing that Liam Tui said to me, and it's very true, women have a very calming effect on men, particularly in the football world. But what I discovered is men want to impress women time-wise in training. So I was getting the best out of guys. So she, I went down to Sheriff Street and coached them through a couple of seasons. Lucky enough, we won the under-18s. They only ever had one premier side, and that was this particular team. We won the under-18s, and it was like a light bulb went on on these guys. Because I had had the advantage of being with Home Farm, where there was money, where there was cars, you know, to bring players to matches. To go down to Sheriff Street, Olivia O'Toole's territory, and you had to literally go down and nearly take the guys out of bed. That's how, you know to get players to come out and play. And then you need to be a psychologist because all they wanted to do was have a go at somebody on the pitch. You know, so it was, it was a really challenge, but I have great memories. But that win down there just changed those players because they went on to be the famous Sheriff United. Eight or nine of them went on to be Sheriff United. And in their very first season, they won eight trophies. So I have great memories down there. Not bad. That's an incredible CV. I, uh, I should hasten to say that I completely screwed up the intro to that story by saying when you finish playing, because Linda is actually still playing walking football to this day. I have to say this. Please don't imagine that walking football is Father Ted stuff. It isn't, right? And I have the bruises. I showed them to you, but they're in places that, you know... You just don't show, um, but definitely it's, 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 it was all COVID. It was COVID that changed it, and I'm playing with the most amazing guys. I mean, amazing guys. I play with four different groups. I'm going to Newcastle to play in a European competition at the end of this month, um, and we'll see where we go from there. They say it's walking, but I think one of my downfalls, is I'll, I'll be pulled up. I'm always running. Uh, Nikki, uh, it's kind of inspiring to listen to somebody have a lifelong love of sport, right? Like, I do think that, though, it's really important that Linda's story gets told and that the football team, they're part of a continuum. You know, they're, they're standing on the backs of the people who came before them and who came before them. And it started with their team 50 years ago this week. Um, and that's the bit, the whole... Uh, I'm always very reluctant to talk about role models in sport, but the whole... If you, if, you, if you don't have visibility and if you don't have support from the media who are here and if you don't have support from broadcasters, the stories get lost. Yeah, definitely. And I think um, one of our like, long-term goals as a team has always been to create that legacy, to grow the game and to inspire the next generation. And even when I look back to when I was in school, I distinctly just remember Sonia Sullivan running in the Sydney Olympics and they wheeled the television into the PE hall and we got out of class for half an hour and I was like, excellent, no school for half an hour. And I just remember being like, I want to play for Ireland. And that was my experience as a child. And that was the visibility I had. I didn't know what sport or how it was. But when you look at in this day and age and the opportunity that exists there and the success that's grown over the past number of years is that kids can see their own models, the we're down in the clubs, down in the schools, playing with them and um, just affording that visibility and the more visibility is there, it's a great opportunity for the next, for the kids coming through. One of the things that always makes me a bit reluctant to talk about this is that we never ask the men, you know, oh, do you feel like you have to be a role model and you have to be represent, you know, it's just, it seems a little bit unfair that you also have to be a world-class athlete and we'll hold you to the same standards as everybody else. But also, we also want you to do this other job over here that's really a government's job or, you know, the... The governing bodies job. So we, we ask a lot of our female sports athletes is, is basically what I'm trying to say. Yeah, definitely. And I mean, when you look at it, it's a, it's a tough one because when you look at Ireland as a nation at the moment, we're not only competing on the world stage, but we're probably dominating. Like you've got the likes of Rachel Blackmore, Katie Taylor, uh, Leona Maguire, and you, with comes with it is just 
is bringing that increased visibility and, and, and giving, affording more opportunity and I think putting, showcasing and broadcasting women's sport like at that peak time of day where it affords people to watch it and, you know, as a nation, we're incredibly social and we love to come together and we love to support any person or athlete or team that are doing well um, in Ireland. And I think they're from the... Uh, research that Carlsberg carried out that this that there's a real shines a light on the fact that we need to put visibility of women's sport at key times of the day that people can see it and I think that un until that stage we still got to we have to do more and we want to do more and we want to inspire young kids and we want to be those role models and create that legacy so yeah I think we being a female athlete comes a certain responsibility that you do have to inspire the next generation but for me I find it incredibly rewarding that now that the players do know who we are on the back of the media Sky campaign the broadcasting and the exposure so for me I, I think it's great and little kids know who we are and they love coming to Tallis Stadium and they've that little extra connection with the fans and they get their autographs and, and their pictures and then obviously off the back of Linda's story qualifying for the World Cup um, I think it's obviously amazing but it's just as much for us as it is for the players that came before us and only off the back of qualifying for World Cup do we know people like Linda, Paula Gorman um, and we're getting to meet them now at events like this so I think that's really special too and um, the Olivia O'Toole's, the Emma Burns that, that came just before us and obviously fought for them, them better conditions and they would have been the players that I would have looked up to throughout my career and got a lot of inspiration from. And quite complimentary because we wouldn't be getting this cap if it wasn't for the success of the Irish girls. So we owe you a great debt. I think, though, it's incredibly fitting almost that the first women's, like first time Ireland qualified for the Women's World Cup is coming on the 50th year, the 50th anniversary. And I've no doubt that the team on the opening day of the tournament will be singing that anthem not just for themselves but for everyone that's come before them and for the decades of female footballers in Ireland absolutely yeah, could I just add you know we talk about the, 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 their standing on our shoulders but the records historical records there's none out there you know just they're all missing there's none there and there's people alive here today you know there's people alive players alive and it can't be just the job of the FAI. It's too big for that now. Because I, as a normal person, if I didn't know football and came into this bar, I'd want to be saying, well, listen, where did this start? You know, who, who started all this? So it's a collective individual sharing of information and also of researchers coming together. Because I can tell you 100%, in order to get this cap, you have to actually prove you had playing time on the pitch. Now, if you can imagine that there are even, the, even the, the programs, wrong names, players who are down who couldn't get off work because we had to pay for our own expenses, players who are, I have in pictures, not on programs, but signed autographs that other, um, like the Welsh FA, they have. So all the, all the information to date is skewed. And we need the history. We need to have it because we might have started, but there were people before us as well. And we need to have that. To, and we need to have a place to put it so that people, the public can come and see it. And that is very important to me. We like, we like telling stories and we like listening to stories and this is a good opportunity for us. But it's a good opportunity for us to listen to those stories and like we are a storytelling race. You know, you, you see the, the great cinema that we've had over the last year, the movie North Circular. It's all about people sitting in rooms like this and singing and telling stories and getting the story out there and putting it on the record and hopefully the next time when we come there will be memorabilia from, from that period of time and pictures from your players because somebody has them somewhere and I suppose that's a, you know, a call that has to go out to like dig upstairs in the attic and, and find your Maz medals. Well, that's what we're doing because I've enabled, I've, I'm helping quite a few players who have no memorabilia. And I'll give you just one quick example. Um, there was a girl who said to me, she's quite sick. She said, I played, I played, I played in, in, in um, Wales. And we had a few games in Wales. And um, I said, oh, right, let me have a look. I had the programme. I kept quite a bit of stuff at the program. I had a picture, but 
but I didn't know what the picture was and didn't know where it was. And um, I spoke to one of the researchers and asked her if she had a contact in the Welch FA. So she gave me a contact, got on to them. Now, the program I had was all the signatures of the Welch player. What they sent me was exactly the same picture, but I'm looking at the camera instead of looking to the side. Exactly the same program, but with all the Irish girls signed on it. And the girls that signed the pictures did not, or that signed the, the program, were not the names that were on the program. And they were the girls that were in my picture. And Paula Gorham is one of those. So she didn't even know that she played a game other than finding out this. So we've managed to get three girls across the line with that one. That's pretty impressive. <clears throat> Colleen Rooney will be proud of that one. Uh, the, the future, Nikki, I want to ask you a little bit about that and the, and the opportunity here for the team to go and create their own legacy. How, how important is it that the fans get behind them? Because you, you talked about it bubbling up and the bandwagon starting. Like, what's it actually like when the messages start coming? Because we've heard different stories from different teams where, um, you know, I think one of the rugby teams one time went away and, and they were like, oh, you've got to go in there for the messages. And they thought there would be a little pile, but the whole wall was covered in them. What's that like for you guys when that actually happens in the middle of a tournament? Yeah, I think, um, firstly, the there is no, I touched on it earlier, but there is no support, like the Irish support. And like, even in um, London, as the games got bigger and the support, the bandwagon grew, running out into stadiums, like you literally could not see anything but a sea of green out there. And I know, especially for the girls as well, like having, they've already moved the opening game against Australia, like due to the ticket, the demands for tickets and there's a huge amount of Irish in Australia and also you'd be so well supported from home as well but yeah as the games went on the bandwagon started to grow and um, obviously it got bigger and bigger as it escalated and there was penalty shootouts and there was sudden death and no one knew the rules and the games were being shown ahead of other sports and the rural parts of Ireland and everyone, no one knew what the rules were, but it was very exciting. So everyone was happy to go along with it, but he just started to get messages and more messages. And then actually, I think probably between the semifinals and finals, we just turned our phones off because you're kind of living in this bubble where you're just, you're in camp mode and you're enjoying each other's company and the team. And you're so focused on the task at hand that um, you don't really have time to process everything until you come home to a homecoming like no other but yeah it's incredibly special and I think the Irish can always bring that extra player support with it and I know the girls probably felt that in the qualifying campaign of having that support and having people coming to watch them and you really you do feel it yeah definitely and I think obviously 80,000 sell out and the first game is going to be pretty special but amazing like us as players we're going to be focused on the game and, and on our task on the pitch but we know that the f whole country will be behind us that there'll be watch parties taking place at home in Ireland people dossing off work and um, yeah it's, it's just going to be amazing with the best fans in the world What's the support been like over the last couple of years as it has been growing because you know uh, there was a great picture that Arsenal put out on their social media yesterday of the game in 2013 and the game last week and it's 1500 at one game and it's 60,000 at the next and like you, you look at the success of the WSL on the back of their tournament that they hosted and it's been clear that you can join these things up you can engage a fan base and in fairness the FAI they've been selling out Tala in a way that we hadn't seen for a long period of time so what's that been like to watch and, and feel in the community when you're out and about? Yeah I think it's amazing obviously the sport we've had with a big sponsor like Sky coming in um, on board was huge and RT broadcasting all the games and then getting a uh, filling out Tallis Stadium and it just gives you that little extra edge and I suppose when you're on the pitch and it's all them small percents that, that make a difference and when I started out playing it probably would have been your, just your family in the stand and you're lucky yeah <laughs> <laughs> if they weren't busy that day um, yeah so look it's amazing it's special to see the demand and the work that the FA have done to, to put in to get behind the team and um, hopefully you can move on to, to bigger stadiums in the future and is, is that is that something that you talk about and you notice as a team that actually, this is actually, you know, we're not niche anymore, we're going mainstream here? I don't know. Do you, I think when you're in the moment, you're just taking it in your stride and every game at a time and you're focused on your training and focused on your playing and um, 
and you know it's special and um, to, to have the, the fans behind you and I think it's something that like we spoke about earlier reflect back on um, when you're finished playing and for me it's just we have to piggyback on the success now qualifying for the World Cup and keep growing and developing our own league here and um, and the future is bright It's also sorry Jared it's just it's in a similar position where you're qualifying itself is a massive massive um, achievement and all that hard work and as Jared t- spoke on earlier and touched on about like the, n- the near misses and the almost and having that belief and like the grit and the determination and the resilience like to come back knowing that you are good enough knowing that there's a World Cup in this team and knowing um, that you can do it and that the World Cup in itself is like it's what you dream of as a child. It's playing in those games and um, it's what you do all the one percenters for the early mornings, the late night shifts and you have, you'd be able to go out there and to enjoy it, enjoy every moment of it and it's incredibly exciting. Uh, Anya talked about, you know, building on from what they have and, and the FAI are doing that. They have an amazing underage teams that are very, very successful, underage schoolgirls, and I can see them filtering up to the senior team, so I'm hoping that if they get a bit of experience or a bit of a taste of what it's like across the water and get some um, contracts across there, that their their game will actually elevate to a, to a standard that you need to play in World Cups and in European Cups. So we've a load of girls coming through. Just to point out that we're talking about fans coming. The Joe Duffy show today was all about a woman who has no interest in women's football but can't get a ticket to the French game um, and go mad because the stadium isn't bigger. And that's the people we want now. That's the visibility that this game is, is giving, is the fact that people who have no interest are now jumping on the bandwagon. And that can only be good for the game. It's also, it's, it's a great opportunity and it's brilliant to see a global band as influential as Carlsberg coming on board, recognising the opportunity there and the... Um, to make that visibility in the lead up to the World Cup and to shine a light on the team and to, you know, wish them well and to get that excitement going for the nation. And I think um, there's a huge opportunity there. Oh, we love a bandwagon. We're world class at it. Absolutely. And uh, yeah, you can be guaranteed that there's going to be plenty of support as well. A reminder that the uh, pub that we're in, normally it's called the Square Ball, but it's been renamed the Gig. It's open all weekend. It's a celebration of the 50th anniversary of the first ever Republic of Ireland International on the 13th of May, all the way back in 1973. We're here with thanks to Carlsberg 00, uh, and we are officially launching Ireland's first women's sports bar. I will open this to uh, questions from the floor if anybody wants to stick their hand up for this. Um, just one last one before I do. Linda, you talked about um, getting to meet the players and, and feel part of the continuum. I guess that's been a pretty good experience for you. It has like really energised you and your generation about, about this, and I hope made you feel a part of what's happening now as well. Once you've played, you're always a part. It's in, it's in, the, it's in the psych. It's never, it never leaves you. What they experience, we experience. It's a completely different world. I couldn't even explain it to half of you here because you're so young. It's like having black and white telly and now you've already got colour. You know, and it's, that, that's the only way I can describe it. HD now. Yeah, well, even that, that, I mean, HD was a telephone in my days. Um, but it's so, uh, and it's so good and... and the, the atmosphere when you walk into, I walked in to have dinner with the girls, it's electrifying. They are so focused, they're so professional. It's, it has to be admired. Now, I love the fact that they're going to the World Cup, but I've had my life and I've had experiences. And at this stage, I can come and say, I've met the most amazing people, I've been influenced by the most amazing people. I couldn't trade it for a World Cup, but I, they will never know what it's like to be in my shoes, but I'll always imagine what it's like to be in their shoes. Yeah, we've got a question here. Hey, this question for Mickey. Um, we saw 7,000 people in the Green who came back from the Silver Medal World Cup, and yet, when you started your league campaign six weeks later, you're still playing in front of 110 people in small 
I know I've got as one of the top 10 people. What lessons can the women's Premier League learn from that experience? Because we're starting to see crowds go up in the women's league. You mean, there's a thousand people on a recent shot on the side. So how do we kind of transfer the interest from the national team back into the league here? Because you're still seeing some of the same players, as the case to yourselves. But all the silver medalists, most of them were at home that, that following season. Just for our, for our radio audience, just how do we transfer the love that uh, fans have for the national team to the local league? I'm shortening it a bit, but that's, the, yeah. Yeah, I think uh, timing is, as we touched on earlier, it's about the timing of the games and also increasing the visibility of at the club games and getting that more broadcasted to show because the international games are similar are every, are every couple of months or when the teams come together it's not weekly but there's a great opportunity at the club level to see some great um, great sport and that the girls are playing like the players are playing at, be it at home and some of them are abroad and it's similar to the hockey as well um, and as we saw last week with the AAL at the the Aviva at club level there's a great opportunity to broadcast that more week in week out yeah it's it's about uh, big brands supporting it's about big broadcasters supporting as well I think it's also about the quality of the league improving like there's been a clear step up in the quality of the league in the last couple of years yeah definitely the standard that has to be obviously a viable product that people want to see and people want to watch as well and obviously Shamrock Rovers going um, semi-professional this year is obviously a step in the right direction um, but back to your point, it is like brands like Carlsberg coming on board and promoting and like, giving it exposure and um, the guys in the media too. Also, I think, sorry, just with the, with the success of the national teams, then the players that are in the national team playing at, at home as well and having those names there also brings the standard up, playing against each other, and it's only a good thing. Could I just add to that? It was great for me to be able to say to young girls when I was asked about the national side, you don't have to go to England to play on the national side. You can live in Ireland and play on the national side. Right. I think we might wrap this up. I think uh, I hope you've all enjoyed it. Uh, as I say, we're here all weekend. If you want to come down and have a look at the memorabilia on the balls, my thanks to Carlsberg Zero Zero for facilitating us tonight. But I think um, the stars of the show this evening, please give it up for Onyo Gorman, Nikki Evans, and Linda Gorman. Off the ball, in partnership with Carlsberg Zero Zero, celebrating Ireland's first women's sports bar.